continually being told, of course, that the products are dangerous and there's a risk that needs to be mitigated. Uh, well, there's a wonderful, statistically deep pool of users here. There's 10, 15 million users in Europe. Yes. Um, and we know the potential of what would have happened to those if they continued to smoke. So we know the what would have been scenario. And the what is scenario is different. It's a much more positive scenario. But if there had been, you know, 5, 10, 1, a small cluster of people who had been, been adversely affected by e-cigarettes, then we would have known about it because all those people who are the naysayers and the scaremongers would have loved to have that poster boy. It would be like that you know, bad analogy potentially, the Area 51 Martian, you know, the, the aliens exist, vaping kills. Yes. Um, but there's not that person, it doesn't exist. Um, and if we had only 50 vapors in the community, then you could understand why it was not statistically reliable. But there's 50 million vapors, at least, and growing by thousands each day, probably. Uh, but there aren't those occurrences. There are some tragic examples of accidents. Yes. Babies ingesting nicotine, dogs in biting bottles and dying of nicotine overdose, people killing themselves with nicotine intentionally. Uh, but people who, through normal usage, have insidiously adversely affected their health, those examples, they don't exist. Well, we, we were talking to uh, Bernd Meyer on, on Monday night, yeah. Professor Bernd Meyer. Now, he's, he's not actually in the nicotine field. He's not in the smoking field. He's a, uh, a cardiologist. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's the guy that came up um, with the revised LD50, if you want to call it that, for nicotine. And, it, and as he said, being very, very conservative, it's between 500 milligrams and a gram for an adult. Um, and he was saying on Monday that the only recorded incident he can find of somebody dying accidentally through the ingestion of nicotine, i.e. not trying to commit suicide, yeah. was a gardener who was using a nicotine pesticide that had been diluted at 80%. Wow. He <laughs> was inhaling that as it was spraying. Yes? Well, he was spraying it around in a greenhouse, so of course the atmosphere is... Yeah. He probably passed out as well. I'd have loved to have walked through it. Yeah, he must have passed out yeah. and just basically, he'll, he'll have absorbed through the skin, he'll have absorbed buckley, he'll have, he'll have absorbed through the lung, through the eyes, everywhere. Mm. Every soft entrance would have been catered for. But that still took all day yeah. to kill him. And that's the only recorded incident mm. that uh, Professor Meyer was able to find. And yeah, we hear about the odd exploding battery, but I, I spoke to um, some firemen, fire persons um, earlier on this week when they came to do the smoke alarm thing, because yes. we get free smoke alarms where we are, which is nice. Mm. Um, and they said, you're not a smoker, so that's fine, you'll not set this off, and I did. We had to do the test, so everybody- You said vaping those things? I, actually, it was my darling wife who oh. took a mouth inhale and puffed it gently at it and it went off. So if you're in the loo on a plane, don't, don't chance it, it's the same one, hypersensitive. But they were saying they get as many fires, well, more fires from phone batteries, especially the ones that are able to be replaced mm. because people will not use the correct charging regime. Well, we've, we've seen that as well with uh, you know, these bad news stories. One implicated ourselves, the Daily Mail, six, seven months ago. And there's a desire for there to be a relationship between e-cigarette batteries and explosions, when actually it's lithium-ion cells. It's a fundamental of how the chemistry is applied to a device, which is the issue. Whether you've got a model helicopter, a mobile phone, an aircraft in a, an A380 battery, or an e-cigarette battery. They fundamentally work on the same chemistry. They have the same latent challenges. Yes. We don't need to picture hole, or picture frame, or pigeonhole, should I say. The e-cigarette battery is a unique device. It's got the same propensity to danger, and it's got the same responsibility to care for it mm. as a helicopter battery or an iPhone battery. Uh, so we're very resistant to allowing our batteries, batteries in the round for e-cigarettes, to be considered as something unique because actually they are unique, but actually ubiquitous. They're unique because they're living mine, but they're ubiquitous because they are available all over. They're in everywhere. all our household devices, absolutely. and you go through them with respect. Yes, they're absolutely everywhere. I, I can't think of a household currently that will not have lithium ion batteries all over the place. Mm -hmm. You look at your tablets, you look at your phones, you look at your toothbrush these days. Even though Duncan Bannatyne thinks that toothbrushes don't have batteries in, 
And I also said, that made me laugh. That really did. It dawned upon him five seconds after he said it, I think. Yeah. He still wasn't going to have it, though. But and it, let, let's he, didn't, he didn't respond, so he recognised he was No, he, he, he was and I are, We're not best friends, he and I. I don't, I don't like the man. But he's like an AC is he? He doesn't like nicotine at all. He mm. thinks anybody that uses an e-cig or uses gum or patches or any form of NRT is weak. <laughs> Interestingly, he's never offered to meet me in the pub and say that to me, Phil. Well, there was that chap who said e cigarettes are fey. Somebody said, said the fey. Fey? Yes. If you, if you want to smoke, then I think it was, um, I think I had an interview with him on the Radio 4 about a year and a half ago. Oh, a bombastic one. Um, oh, what's his name? I know the guy you mean. I mean I'm sure I'm, I might be paraphrasing incorrectly, but I'm sure he said they were fake. I'm, I'm pretty sure he did, yes. Yes, fair was the word. Um, it's a nice word, I think, inappropriate, mind. Uh, completely Not inappropriate. It's, no, it's, it's anything but. Um, I've, I've always thought that, I mean, you, you know I'm fairly libertarian anyway, and as mm. far as I'm concerned, if somebody wants to smoke, that's fine. I still have ashtrays in my house, although I haven't touched a fag in almost six years. Mm. The ashtrays are still there. We've had film crews come round and you see them rolling up and say, I'm just going to nip outside. He's piddling it down. There's an ashtray in. You know, mm. I've got no problem with that at all because I don't believe the second-hand smoke argument for one second. Mm. People of our generation um, were brought up in effectively smoky shafts. We had coal fires. The year I was born, smoking prevalence in the UK was in the order of 87%. It's pretty high. Was it? 1955, 87%. Wow. It was fairly, fairly closely post-war. People were pretty, tra pretty traumatised. And during the war, almost 100% of adults smoked. There were very few who didn't. Mm. Um, so it dropped to 85% by 1955. By 1973, when NRT, the first NRT got its licence, smoking prevalence in the UK was 42% there or thereabouts. So it halved mm. in the 18 years. Since then, it's halved again, but it's taken an awful lot longer. Yeah, mm. 40 years for it to half again. Um, it's a resilient base, I think, that 20%, isn't it? It's a bit like 20% now, but it's been a very resilient, very resistive base to change. I, th I think the more, the more people get kind of lambasted and lectured and put upon, the less likely they are to accede to the requests from on high. Yeah. The, the, the fact of the matter is that if in 18 years half of the people that were smoking, and they couldn't have all died in that period of time, if half of them had packed in without any help, no NRT, no stop smoking services, none of that, none of that existed at all, mm. and yet half of them packed in. They just did. I'm one of those. Yeah. Well, my granddad did. 20 years he didn't smoke. You went back to them? Yeah. Otherwise. Well, as he pointed out, um, he got the seven. He would have forgotten about that, wouldn't he? 20 years? Well, he. I forgot what he was like to smoke. He, 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 I don't think he ever did, no. Yeah. 20 years he went with that. He was a miner, so for all of his working time, he couldn't smoke. So he could only smoke when he wasn't working and wasn't sleeping, mm. which left a very small part of the day, really, mm. eight hours, I suppose. Um, but he got to 70. And his generation had a life expectancy. He always thought of three score years and ten. When you're three score years and ten, he's up. That's you. So he was on borrowed time, might as well smoke again. So he, he got the 70 and uh, he got a cold. And an old friend of his says, you want a fag? That'll put that right. And my granddad, just out of daftness, had a fag. And lo and behold, <laughs> it's going to sound awful, coughed his guts up and that was him sort that he needed to clear his chest and that was what happened and mm. that was fine. So he decided he'd carry on. And far from shortening his life, he was 93 when he died. Mm. 93. And smoked all of his life, bar those 20 years. And but there's no doubt there, it's a bad habit. It's a bad habit. Well, it is. I mean, you know... It, it, I'm it, better for not smoking, I know. I've, I've lived in both parts of that spectrum. I smoked for best part of 25 years. I started when I was a very young boy, embarrassingly young, from a smoking family. How embarrassingly young? Uh, short pants young. Come on, I was it. I was, well, I used to borrow, stroke, steal my mother's sovereign cigarettes from my brother when uh, I must have been less than 10 because it was a house that I moved from when I was 10, my mm. brother and I. So yes, single, single digits, smoked all the way through my teens 
and through my naval career, uh, and I stopped about 13 years ago, um, really difficult for me. And I'm way better for not smoking than I am. Physically, I'm a lot better. Um, so I, and it is, it's, it's not a good habit, and I, I, would, I would hate for my children to smoke again. Uh, I wouldn't openly advocate them vaping, but if they wanted to vape in preference of smoking, clearly they would be on my bed and knee if that was the option I was presented with. I think if you asked any parent, that would be the reply. It would be. You have to be ridiculous not to. I'd rather, there's no need to be addicted to anything. An addiction-free lifestyle surely is, as long as you're happy and content, then there's no need to bring addictions into your life, is it? Um, if you're happy and content, if that's what you want, if that's what gives you pleasure, then so be it. it, it that, you know, that, that's, a, that's, that's a question that we'd probably talk about for months and months and months, never mind minutes and hours. Mm. Um, because I've been, I've looked at addiction from all sides being a reform. It's a loose definition as well. Though, it's it? very, very loose and it, it generally means that uh, I, I understand addiction, true addiction, to be something which alters body chemistry such that you cannot survive without it. And mm. we're starting to talk in terms of heroin and the heavy opiates and various other stuff like that, that you cannot just stop cold turkey without doing yourself physical damage. And the same applies to someone who's an extreme alcoholic, if you like. Mm. Um, to just cut that cold turkey, you cease to function. And it's the sole focus damage. for the day, for the life. It's the one thing, the only thing. Yes. But addiction now is being uh, understood to be something that, that, that promotes the release of endorphins that promotes enjoyment mm. and because that becomes um, I, I'm not even going to say habitual but you, you seek that enjoyment or you seek the release it's more the associative enjoyment. isn't it yes um, and on that basis and, and it doesn't have to be detrimental drinking heavily and opiates detrimental clearly not only to your long term health but also to the ability for you to live a balanced life yes and you can smoke drink coffee and use alcohol and still have a balanced life you can. It's maybe on the same spectrum, technically you could call it addiction, but of course it's a wide panoply of how it affects people. And I, I think it's a term that's been um, misappropriated and, and is used pejoratively now. Mm. Um, so I, I agree with you when it comes to uh, nicotine that it is benign. There's nothing to equivocate about. It's benign, isn't it? We know it is. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I've got two, two grandsons, one's very new, and if when they're 13 and 14 I get a whiff of... Uh, tobacco around them, I should be taking them into the office where the currently 120 odd probably by then, I don't know how many thousands of e cigs there'll be, mm. and it'll be, pick the one you like, yeah. pick the juice you like, that's where you go. I think children's attitudes have changed though, I, I, I think if I speak to my children about tobacco smoking as I have, they think it's a ridiculous concept, why would you ever? Mm. There's a lot more awareness, a lot more peer group pressure positive peer group pressure that now exists in certain children's influence, and not all children's influence. Yes. Unfortunately, my children's influence, I think, are more positive than some potentially other children are exposed to. Um, because of how they're educated and where they live, uh, I was born in Blackburn and my influences were different to what my children are now fortunate to have. But that's a very positive influence, and I don't think their peer group would ever continent think about smoking, because it's ridiculous to them. Peer. I think it varies through uh, throughout the country, certainly in my part of the world, there are still great gaggles of youngsters who gather together and uh, take the oldest looking one into the shop to go and buy a pack of 20. So as we did. Of course we did. It's not right or wrong, it's just as it is, it's just a fact. Yeah. People people try everything. Even even Professor Glantz has now acknowledged that the more adult you may make something, the more likely youth are to try it yeah. because they want to grow. They do, yeah, they do. And he's finally acknowledged that. He just needs now to acknowledge everything else that we've been telling for the last four years and he might find it.